Welcome back to Student to Stud. In this episode, we'll go over subtrochanteric fractures and everything that you should know as a medical student. Here's the basic outline on what we'll cover in this presentation. Case 1. What do you see? We have three views, AP pelvis, AP left hip, and cross table lateral of a left hip, demonstrating a left transverse subtrochanteric fracture with displacement posterior and medial. How would you treat this fracture? This fracture was treated with a long cephalomedullary nail. The typical presentation for subtrochanteric hip fractures in the elderly population will usually be low energy injuries. In the younger population, they will usually be due to higher energy type of injuries. 10% of subtrochanteric hip fractures are due to gunshot injuries. When you obtain your history from your patient, you want to make sure that you ask the patient if they had any groin or thigh pain leading up to their presentation. You want to ask about the mechanism of injury. If they say they simply were standing when their leg gave out, this should alert you to the possibility of this fracture being pathologic. You want to ask if they have any symptoms or pain on the contralateral leg. Do they have a history of cancer? Do they take bisphosphonate medications or have they taken this medication in the past? Does the patient have a past history of sustaining a femoral neck fracture that was treated with cannulated screws? Do you remember from our femoral neck lecture on why this would be important? In that lecture, we discussed the importance of keeping your screws above the lesser trochanter to prevent a stress riser from forming. If you place your screws below the lesser troch, this could create a stress riser which could cause a fracture. The screws weaken the tension side of the proximal femur cortex. Your physical exam will be consistent with the past exams from femoral neck and intertrochanteric hip fractures. The patient will be unable to walk, the leg can be shortened and externally rotated, they will have pain with any hip motion, they will be tender to palpation of the proximal femur. You want to make sure that they are adequately resuscitated as these fractures can have a significant amount of blood loss. We briefly mentioned pathologic fractures in regards to subtrochanteric fractures. A major cause of pathologic fractures in the subtrochanteric region are due to bisphosphonate medications such as alendronate. Also, a medication similar to bisphosphonates that you may remember from medical school is denosumab. Denosumab is a monoclonal antibody against the rank ligand. Fractures caused by bisphosphonates are thought to be due to bisphosphonates preventing stress fractures from healing, which will then progress to a complete fracture. When you have a patient that you suspect their fracture could be pathologic, you need to image the contralateral femur. On x-ray, subtrochanteric fractures due to bisphosphonate medications will have four radiographic characteristics. They are lateral cortical thickening, transverse fracture orientation, medial spike, and a lack of comminution. Here's an example of lateral cortical beaking from a patient who is on prolonged bisphosphonate medications. For completeness sake, bisphosphonates inhibit bone resorption by suppressing osteoclasts and decreasing bone turnover. There are two different types of bisphosphonate medications, non-nitrogen containing and nitrogen containing. Nitrogen containing bisphosphonates inhibit osteoclasts for an osyl pyrophosphate synthase enzyme. Non-nitrogen containing bisphosphonates cause premature death and apoptosis to the osteoclast by forming a toxic ATP analog. So what do you do when you have someone with a pathologic fracture due to bisphosphonates? You want to prescribe them calcium, vitamin D, discontinue their bisphosphonates or other anti-resorptive agents. You want to prophylactically treat an incomplete fracture with a cephalomedullary nail unless the patient is pain-free. So what is considered the subtrochanteric region of the femur? It is defined as the area between the lesser troch and 5 cm distal. This region is comprised of cortical bone which has longer healing times. When you are looking at an AP x-ray of the hip, you always want to look at the lesser trochanter as this can be a landmark to help you determine the rotation of the proximal fragment. The lesser trochanter is a posterior structure, so if you are seeing more of the lesser troch, then the proximal fragment is externally rotated. The medial cortex is under compressive forces and the lateral cortex is under tensile forces. 
Sometimes, when you see this subtrochanteric fracture in the emergency department, you consider traction prior to surgical intervention. If you use traction, you will help minimize blood loss by decreasing the potential third space in the zone of injury. You must understand the deforming forces when treating subtrochanteric fractures. This region is encased with muscle. Let's break the fracture into two parts, a proximal and distal segment. The proximal segment is acted on in three different ways. First, the gluteus medius and minimus cause abduction. The short external rotators cause external rotation. The last deforming force on the proximal fragment is the iliopsoas, which causes flexion. The distal fragment has two major deforming forces, the adductors, which cause adduction, and the hamstrings and quadriceps, which cause shortening. These deforming forces are key to understanding your reduction in the operating room and potential complications. You want to obtain several x-rays, an AP pelvis, AP and lateral of the hip, AP and lateral of the entire femur. You can obtain traction views to help with preoperative planning. You want to image the contralateral femur if there's any hint of this fracture being pathologic. You can obtain a CT, MRI, and bone scan as indicated. The Russell-Taylor classification is the most widely accepted classification. This classification was used in the past to determine which nail could be used. Type 1 is defined as having an intact piriformis fossa. Type 2 is defined as having the fracture line extending into the piriformis fossa. Subtype A states that there is a stable posterior medial cortex. Subtype B states that there is an unstable posterior medial cortex. Type 1B will have a greater varus stress than a 1A since there is a lack of intact medial cortical bone. There are three main treatment options for subtrochanteric fractures. Non-operative treatment, 95 degree plates, and long intramedullary nails. Non-operative treatment is quite rare. If you were to treat a subtrochanteric fracture non-operatively, you would have to have the patient lay in skeletal traction with their hip flexed at 90 degrees and knee flexed at 90 degrees for approximately 8 to 12 weeks. You would follow their healing with serial x-rays. The tolerances are 5 degrees of varus and valgus, less than 1 centimeter of shortening, 25% fracture apposition, and no rotation. Even in patients who do not ambulate, you should recommend operative fixation as stabilizing these fractures can lead to improved pain control, improved mobilization, and improvement in the care caretakers can provide. Operatively, you can treat these fractures with 95 degree plates. Plating is inferior biomechanically to IM nails with a 25 to 30% failure rate. Lastly, a long intramedullary nail has excellent outcomes with a union rate of 97%. You want to be familiar with the two types of nails that can be used, a recon nail and a cephalomedullary nail. A recon nail will usually have two screws in the femoral head, whereas a cephalomedullary nail will have one large screw in the femoral head. The major takeaway is that you want to use a long nail, as studies have demonstrated that when a short nail was used, there's an increased risk of fractures to the femoral shaft as the femoral shaft is unprotected. In the literature, there was a debate between trochanteric nails or piriformis nails and which starting point was better. Studies have demonstrated that these have equivalent outcomes. You want to understand the basic approach when using a plate to treat subtrochanteric fractures. You will use a lateral approach between the greater troch and the shaft of the femur. You will dissect through the tensor fascia lata and the vastus lateralis. You will need to cauterize the perforating vessels which are from the profunda femoris artery. You will want to have four bicortical screws distal to the fracture. This translates to eight cortices being engaged. When you are templating which plate you want to use, you want to have at least five plate screw holes distal to the fracture. You can also consider bone grafting as well. We will now discuss nails. When you use a nail, you should make your incision approximately 5 cm proximal to the tip of the greater trochanter. You will dissect through the tensor fasciolata and the abductors. 
Now some of these fractures you will attempt to reduce without having to open, but if you can't get a satisfactory reduction, you should open the fracture with a separate incision. You may need to put a cerclage cable or clamp or another device around the fracture to get your reduction. It is important to remember that the nail will not aid in your reduction. Once you put the nail down, that will be the reduction you bought. You want to over ream 1.5 millimeters to 2 millimeters larger than the nail you plan on putting in. This helps dissipate the hoop stresses. Hoop stresses are the circumferential expansion stresses on the bone when you insert the nail. The typical starting position needs to be just medial to the tip of the greater troke. If you have a starting point that is too lateral on the greater trochanter, it will lead to a varus malreduction and lateral cortical gapping. On your lateral x-ray, you want your starting point to be on the anterior third and middle third of the trochanteric ridge. You want to cheat anteriorly as the femoral neck is anterior to the femoral shaft. Cheating anterior will help when placing your proximal screws in a straighter path into the femoral head. Lastly, you want to place a distal interlocking screw in your nail to provide rotational stability and prevent femoral shortening. The only situation that I can think of that you may not need to place a distal interlocking screw is when you are nailing prophylactically. There are many potential complications to subtrochanteric fractures. First, you can have a loss of fixation. This complication is seen with nailing when you do not statically lock the device, or if you insert your nail through significant comminution, or if you use a nail that is too small in diameter. Nails will usually fatigue through the lag screw hole in the nail. If you have a loss of fixation or implant failure, this requires surgical revision in almost every case. A typical rule of thumb is that plates are revised to nails and nails are revised to plates, but this is definitely an area of debate and each case needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Next, we will discuss non-unions. If the patient has been unable to resume full weight bearing after six months and has had significant pain and lacks radiographic evidence of healing, then you should be suspicious of a non-union. If the nail or proximal interlocking screw breaks, this can indicate non-union. When dealing with non-unions, you want to confirm that this is not due to an infection. When treating non-unions, you can treat these with exchange nailing with over-reaming and using bone grafting, or you can use a plate. Bone grafting would be indicated for atrophic non-unions. If you have a hypertrophic non-union, your fracture requires increased stability. Non-unions can be caused by excessive soft tissue stripping, placing cercage cables which devitalize the bone, and aggressive manipulation of the medial fragments. If you make sure to handle the medial comminution with care and maintain these fragments, the fracture has an improved chance of healing. With residency, I learned that when tackling revision cases, you want to get as much information prior to surgical fixation. You want to get the original injury films, the initial operative report, Get as many x-rays post-operatively. Obtain a complete history from your patient. Did they have an infection in the past? Do they have diabetes and what is their smoking history? You want to obtain vitamin D levels. You want to order ESR and CRP to rule out infection. Next, we will discuss malunions. Your patient may complain of leg length discrepancy, walk with a limp, or have rotational deformities such as their foot pointing in a different direction than the contralateral side. The most common deformity is varus in shortening or flexion. Malunions were defined as shortening greater than 1 cm, 10 degrees of angulation in any plane, and rotational malalignment greater than 15 degrees. Other complications that can happen are continued pain with nailing. Studies have demonstrated that with nailing you can cause injury to the piriformis and or obturator internus which has been attributed to generating continued pain. A known complication with nailing is anterior perforation of the distal femur. There are several risk factors such as having a shorter patient, having an increased anterior bow of the femur, and having a posterior starting point. Let's next go over some practice cases. How would you read these x-rays? We have three views, AP pelvis, AP right hip, and cross table lateral of a right hip demonstrating a right spiral subtrochanteric fracture with posterior medial displacement with shortening. How would you treat this fracture? This fracture was treated with a long cephalomedullary nail with a distal interlocking screw. Case 3. How would you read these x-rays? 
Did you see the lateral cortical beaking on the right proximal femur? Did you say to yourself, is this person on bisphosphonate medications or are they having symptoms on their contralateral leg? If you had these thoughts, you were definitely paying attention. If I were reading this x-ray, I would say we have three views, AP pelvis, AP right hip, and frog leg lateral of a right hip, demonstrating a right lateral cortical thickening without fracture. How would you treat this patient? Well, first, you would want to ask the patient if they were having any symptoms. In this case, the patient said that they were having pain, therefore, you would treat this patient with a long nail. In this case, it was locked distally with one screw. This patient had negative femur films on the contralateral side without any thigh or groin pain. Last case, how would you read these x-rays? We have three views, AP pelvis, AP right hip, and cross table lateral of a right hip, demonstrating a right transverse subtrochanteric fracture with varus angulation. This fracture pattern should alert you to the possibility of being pathologic. Why? What makes these injury films suspicious? Well, the fracture is transverse in orientation and there is minimal to no comminution. Sure enough, contralateral femur films were taken. What do you see? There are two lateral cortical thickenings along the lateral aspect of the proximal femur. How would you treat this patient? The right subtrochanteric fracture was treated with a long nail with one screw locked distally. The left femur was prophylactically nailed. This nail was not locked distally. Let's finish off this lecture with some pimp questions. What should you always entertain when you see a subtrochanteric fracture? Is this fracture pathologic or atypical? If a patient is on bisphosphonate therapy and complaining of right thigh pain, what imaging is required? X-rays of both femurs. How many centimeters from the lesser trochanter defines the subtrochanteric region? 5 centimeters. What muscle causes flexion of the proximal segment? The iliopsoas. Name the two abductor muscles that cause abduction deformity of the proximal fragment. The gluteus medius and minimus. Name one classification for subtrochanteric fractures. The Russell-Taylor classification. What is the mechanism of action for bisphosphonates? Bisphosphonates bind hydroxyapatite in bone, which inhibits resorption by osteoclasts. What are the two types of bisphosphonate medications? Non-nitrogen containing and nitrogen containing. Nitrogen containing bisphosphonates inhibit what enzyme? Paranisyl pyrophosphate synthase enzyme. Name four characteristics seen in bisphosphonate related subtrochanteric fractures. Lateral cortical thickening, transverse fracture orientation, medial spike, and a lack of comminution. A bisphosphonate subtrochanteric fracture treated with an IM nail has a higher risk of iatrogenic fracture. What does it mean when the nail has a greater radius of curvature when compared to the femur? The nail is straighter than the femur. Most common deformity after nailing? Varus in shortening or flexion. How many millimeters may you need to over ream? 1.5 millimeters to 2 millimeters. How many months do you wait before you worry about non-union? 6 months. And that's all for subtrochanteric hip fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.